talking about the business opportunity. This presentation came out of a bunch of research I did to try to quantify the size of the Linux marketplace. <clears throat> I want to preface everything I say by saying that my customers dragged me into Linux against my wishes back in 1994. I had 30 of Australia's Fortune 500 running all or part of their business on Linux as early as the beginning of 1998. In order to start using Linux to run a real life business, I found that I had to do an awful lot of fixing of packages that were broken in the Linux distribution I was using at that time because the, package, the overall product was simply not up to what I needed to do with it. <clears throat> I started working with a group of vertical solution providers and resellers across Australia. I had 15 independent consultants working for me around the globe approximately 11 of whom, well, I had the, the, approximately the equivalent, equivalent of 11 men or people working for me full-time across those 15 people. I had people working for me in the UK, in Europe, in North America, in uh, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Australia. <clears throat> I was acting as a prime contractor, and those people were doing the the heavy lifting for me. <clears throat> I spent 30% of my time running my own business, 30% of my time doing professional training, and 40% of my time on Samba, but that gradually was gobbled up by doing nothing other than maintaining my own Linux distribution. My Linux distributions were based off Red Hat. I started working with Red Hat 303, I'd used Slackware before that. That wasn't my introduction to Linux. Uh, I'd been working with Linux for about a year and a half before I started to maintain my own distribution. The first Linux distribution I started to build was based off the Red Hat Rembrandt uh, code. Rembrandt was going to be Red Hat 3.0.4. It never quite happened. That became the Colgate release, or Red Hat 4.0. When 4.0 came out, it took me about five months to actually stabilize that product so it was suitable for enterprise server use. Um, <clears throat> overall, I did 127 releases that were used commercially. Uh, to my knowledge, none of the um, um, my particular breed of the derivative of Red Hat Linux is still in use today. It's at six years ago since the last release went out. In any case, I approached Red Hat with the offer to build a, an enterprise class server operating system distribution way back in 1997. Uh, Red Hat at that time, as uh, you may recall, were chasing the Linux desktop and my proposition to Red Hat and to Bob Young was that if you want to get the desktop, you first have to capture the, the, the business marketplace. And the business marketplace that, that Linux was ready for is the small to medium business marketplace. In any case, sparing you a lot of detail that is unnecessary, that relationship with Red Hat never quite eventuated as it was intended, and about... Um, about August, September 1998, I was introduced, well, Cliff Miller, who was the founder of Turbo Linux, came to Australia and was introduced to 10 of my customers who were running their business off Linux. And Cliff's big question was, how do you make money with Linux? I was bringing in uh, approximately half a million dollars in revenue a year spending 30% of my time running my business. I had a reasonably comfortable existence in those days. 
I think I, that, that through, I believe that through my contacts with the reseller channel and the vertical line of business solution manufacturers, that's the, the, the houses that both develop the software, the vertical solution stack software, and sell it and have a reseller channel, and my working with that channel, I believe, put me into a fairly unique position to understand how the channel works. I also ex had first-hand experience at some of the problems of being a reseller, either as a just a plain hardware reseller or as a value-added service provider. It was around the time that a company called MerryCell, I don't know if you can remember that company at all, they started to say if you don't provide value-added services, you're going to be out of business within two years. They were absolutely correct. They were almost prophetic in their words. So armed with that, um, I was offered a rather unique opportunity to, um, to join Turbo Linux as VP of development. My first priority was to build the product, that is the Linux distribution. Now, Turbo Linux was based off Red Hat 4.2, uh, but it had been very substantially enhanced to provide Asian-wide character support. That is um, what was commonly known as um, um, CKJV. That's Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Vietnamese. Um, <clears throat> in, in essence, I ended up launching Turbo Linux Australia. I helped Turbo Linux to launch into China. Um, <clears throat> and I joined them at the first Linux world where I saw that the market was ripe and very shortly thereafter was offered a position based out of California to help launch Turbo Linux globally. The deal was that we were going to create a Linux distribution, a server product, as well as a desktop workstation product. The server product was to compete with Microsoft Back Office 4.5 and the Microsoft Small Business Server. Uh, we built that product, but and in the process of building that product, learn, I learned an awful lot about the deficiencies of building a Linux distribution. To cut a very long story short, or in the Australian spoonerist vernacular, to cut a long shorey stort, um, <clears throat> I discovered that uh, as we tried to implement glibc 2.1, that it was almost impossible to build a clean glibc library because it would have backwards references to the libraries on the platform on which it was built, meaning that if you built it on a glibc 2.0 platform, it would have backwards references and you'd have quite a bit of error handling. And ultimately, that is something that was addressed by the Linux Standards Base Initiative that produced Xi, the self-hosting environment, and the LSB reference libraries. And that was originally and initially done by hand-building a glibc library. Now, that was quite a, a horrendous task for the team that did that. I um, came to the US with Turbo Linux and within 10 days realized that the company I had joined was going to do things quite different from what I had imagined we were going to do, what I understood we were going to do. Instead of focusing on a channel, uh, on the uh, value-added service provider channel, we ended up focusing on selling clustering software, and we were still going to do the channel thing. We managed to get about almost a 1,000 resellers to sign up on a VAR program uh, committed to third-level help support through Turbo Linux, but that was killed off when Turbo Linux went through a major reduction in force and a refocus and essentially said, we're not in this market, we're too small to compete with Microsoft, we just can't do that. I joined Caldera with the express intent of helping Ransom Love to set up a channel initiative I had to do a, quite a bit of firefighting on first coming to Caldera. 
I was there for nearly 18 months before I was finally moved from the Bay Area to Salt Lake City to head up half of the company to bring about that vision of a channel-oriented business. And the day that I reported for duty, Ransom Love was, um, he stood down is what the press reported, so I'll repeat that mantra, you can draw your own conclusions. And my new job was put on hold, and four months later, I was also stood down. I mean, I stood down. You can draw your own conclusions there, too. I can't discuss any of the other background to that, because after all, we're on uh, camera here, and I might be in trouble for what I could say. But so, so I won't say it, so you'll just have to keep on imagining. In any case, the overriding question, oh, while I was at uh, Caldera, I built a product that was called the Volution Office Server Version 2 that was to be a, a product to be positioned into the marketplace as an alternative to the Microsoft Small Business Server and Microsoft Back Office Version uh, 2000. That product also was killed because we were not big enough to compete with Microsoft and we would be criticized for the deficiencies in the product. I'm not quite sure what all of that quite meant, but uh, we'll just let, leave that rest at that. The bottom line is the product did not go ahead. And the whys and wherefores we won't discuss now either. The trouble is that e every step along the way, there was criticism from experts who knew everything better than anyone else in the industry. The expert said, the place you've got to be, you know the, the, the old story about the... Um, um, yeah, Ted Clampett and uh, what's it called again? Uh, Beverly the Beverly Hillbillies, thanks. Yeah, you know, about Beverly Hills, the place you ought to be, swimming pools, movie stars. That's the Enterprise Linux spo uh, folks, spa uh, space folks. That's where all the money is. And if you can build a Linux business that's targeted at the Enterprise space, you're going to have a multi-billion dollar business overnight. Yeah! We're going to change all the rules, yeah. And Linux is going to become enterprise class ready, whatever that means. I don't think there's any greater clarity about that subject today than there, as there, were, there was then. We um, saw some excellent presentations yesterday of some really cool technology, but I still beg the question, is that what your 14 user site needs to use? And that, that's a question that really was not definitively answered. It was kind of skirted around, which is understandable. So <clears throat> it's been a little bit of a personal bugbear to me that experts have been able to tell me that the enterprise space is where it's at and the rest doesn't count. Well, I've done a lot of research over the years and just over the, uh, the latter quarter of the... Uh, last year, <coughs> decided to test, to test my earlier assumptions and try to gain some sense of personal validation. Was I smoking something like crack that I ought to be put behind bars for, or was I really right on the money? And if my assumptions originally were correct and are still correct today, then where is the business opportunity and how are we going to capture it? So, my intent is not to pour cold water on the, uh, and to rain on the parade of those who are doing Linux business today. May they be blessed. May their lucky stars shine all through the night for them. But in the cold light of day, I'd like to see greater success. And I think that sentiment really lies at the heart of many people in the open source community. So the, what I want to do is just walk you through some of the statistics that I've picked up. I revised these numbers based on recent, more recent feedback, which I don't necessarily agree with, but it doesn't change the picture enough to warrant changing the assumptions. So I'm going to show you the recast figures based on feedback from the community. And I do work on the premise that enough feedback from the community really does help. Whether it's right or not, it does help. So what I want to do is look at how big is the market, how is the market best approached, how is it broken up into bite-sized chunks, because you know the question, don't you, how do you eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. 
So what bite-sized chunks can we identify in the marketplace that will help us to devour this big mammoth beast? And then what I want to do is look at what ma markets are addressed by Microsoft, where is Linux position today, and what's the problem? Or, or put the other way, you know the flip side of what's the problem? So where's the opportunity? So let's estimate the market size. The first th figures that I would uh, refer you to are the 2002, which is the most recent, uh, con rather concrete figures available, Internal Revenue Service of United States Company um, tax return statistical information breaking the entire North American market down by company size. Now, as you're looking through this, <clears throat> what I'd like you to do is just repeat to yourself, 89.1% of the gross domestic product of the United States is produced by companies that employ fewer than 14 people. Just repeat that over and over and keep that in your head. Let that little recorder, you know, hand crank that recorder so it keeps repeating 89% of GDP, fewer than 14 employees. 89.1% fewer than 14 employees. And you get quite a swing on that. Now while you're thinking that in the back of your head, let's have a look at this. There are 5.7 million firms that file a tax return in North America. 16,800 of those companies employ more than 500 people. 82,000 employ between 100 and 499. 508,000 companies employ 20 to 100 people. 5 million companies employ fewer than 20 people. <clears throat> But the 500 plus employ, uh, employing companies, that is companies that employ more than 500 people, employ 49.9% of, of, of the North American employment force. That's scary when you think of it. Especially when you come to consider that those 16,000 companies are owned by about 440 discrete owners gets scarier by the minute, doesn't it? Still, it is the companies that employ fewer than 500 people that comprise the bulk of the gross domestic product. Why is that? If that is the case, where is most of the money? Let's move on. Trying to get some sort of global sense of this, America produces, that's the United States of America, produces 21% of global gross domestic product. That means that if all things are equal, we should be able to multiply the U.S. business demographics by a factor of five to estimate the global marketplace. However, Companies overseas are very quick to point out that America is totally unique in the global scope and scheme of things because there are more big businesses in America than anywhere else. After all, it's the country where there's big business and everywhere else in the world they're just little itsy bitsy things. Well, you've seen the demographics. Does it hold up? The reality is that when we compare the U.S. business demographic profile with that of Australia, England, and other traditionally developed countries, the profile is more or less identical. If we compare it with countries like India and China, there is indeed a slightly larger preponderance of smaller businesses but the, the big businesses still exist. So, let's try to estimate how many servers there are in existence. That gives us a measure of how many servers we might get support contracts for, if we got all of the market. So here I have a breakdown of company size with the average number of employees per company, the average number of users per server within that particular market segment, 
the USA 2002 business profile, a global factor. So I'm defactoring by using a factor of three. I defactor the large business proportion. I defactor the 100 to 499 employee business portion, and I keep the factor of five for the others. So if anything, I'm doing a slight injustice to the upper end of the market. That's reasonable, isn't it? It's also reasonable considering that the average number of users in a large enterprise server is probably a little bit more than 50, so that I, I'm arguing that that's probably self-correcting. That means there are about 3.3 million servers, and in the previous estimate I said the number of servers was about 7.67% uh, of the installed base. This defactors that in the enterprise space to 6.3% of all servers, but that 6.3% that that is, is housed within only 0.2% of the total business opportunity space. Business opportunity being customers with whom you can do business. You can see there that there are roughly 34 million servers in the 20 to 100 user space, and a very large portion of that consists of servers that are sold as desktop workstations that are actually used as servers. In other words, they never appear in the IDC or the Gartner research information. Am I making sense? Do you, you're a VAR, do you agree with my assumptions and assertions here? You do. Am I far off? You don't think so. So let's move on then. That means that nearly 90% of the entire server base is installed within the 20 to 100 user space. There's something we need to recognize about this because throughout this business space, it is Microsoft Small Business Server that has the bulk of the penetration in the marketplace, and it uses both Active Directory and Microsoft Exchange technology in order to lock the desktop into the back end. That means that your likelihood of displacing the desktop with a far superior solution at a much lower price is about as good as the survival chances of a snowflake in the fires of hell until we can displace that back office solution. And Microsoft know it. So moving on. What is the approximate market share and penetration? What are the approximate number of servers? And this, this is based on a, a, gr a group of different statistics. So I'm underestimating the total market by a significant factor. It looks like right now we have an installed base of somewhere around 34 million servers, according to this, uh, the, these figures, uh, roughly 50% of which is accounted for by Windows, and roughly 30% of which is accounted for by Linux. So we already have a fairly significant install base. It just doesn't show anywhere. What you'll see from this is that the NetWare install base is shrinking. The Unix install base is shrinking slightly. But we also need to take into account that the total number of user seats that are using Linux is actually growing. The reason for which the server base is shrinking is because CPU power has increased and now a much smaller server can handle a lot more users. <clears throat> so contrary to much of what the market pundits say about Unix losing so much ground personally, it is my opinion, based on some inside and outside perspectives on the market, that the Unix install base, despite anything that some companies may assert, has been relatively static despite the introduction and uh, dissemination and, and deployment of Linux. These are some IDC-based um, estimates of the uh, install base of servers and desktop systems. I don't know... Uh, exactly how they could come to the same information. All of this is year 2002 baseline data, so it's a, a little dated. <coughs> According to this, we have an install base of about 8.3 million Linux servers and about 19.7 million desktops. 
I'd like to believe the latter. I don't believe the earlier number. In fact, I don't believe either of them to be terribly close estimates. We do, however, know from the Netcraft survey that there are about 74 million web servers, roughly 70% of which run Apache, roughly half of which runs on Linux. Now, we also know that web servers can be multiply hosted, so this is not a metric of the number of servers that are in use. So we'll have to skip that one for now, but it kind of tells us, if you look at the graph, that the number of web servers has been growing, and therefore there ought to have been a fairly significant increase in the market deployment rate for web servers, which would account for the growth in the number of servers in the marketplace, and my argument is, therefore, that the back office deployment marketplace has been relatively static for the last 15 years. Would you like me to repeat that? There has not been a concomitant, that's a parallel growth, in the back office server, that's the file and print serving marketplace, and the SQL serving marketplace for traditional SQL use. Microsoft's SQL server is not dominantly used for web applications and it is not dominantly used for vertical line of business applications because the end user does not make the choice about the SQL server back end for a vertical line of business solution. If you buy funky junk accounting or ERP or uh, CRM software, you get whatever back end comes with it. You don't get to optionally trans transplant that to another SQL server. The dominant use of Microsoft SQL Server, in my experience, particularly in the small to medium business and enterprise space, is as a data repository for Excel spreadsheet data and for Microsoft for multi-user Microsoft Access applications. Now just ponder that for a moment. How which of the PostgreSQL or MySQL application is targeted at that particular use? It's only relatively recent that we started to get reasonable ODBC driver support for MySQL. It wasn't there. In fact, PostgreSQL led the field there for a number of years. So let's move on beyond all of this specialty stuff and come back to the next question. How many IT users might there be globally? Well, there is, the global population is around 6.4 billion people, and according to the... Um, to, world, uh, to internetworldstats.com, there are approximately 957 million IT users in the world. Now, there are clearly not that many PCs. In fact, the number of PCs in active use, the estimate of how many there are varies between 350 million and about 520 million systems. Well, that's rational, that, that's palatable, because in the domestic marketplace, in the, the home consumer marketplace, uh, it's not unusual for a whole family to use one PC. Also, there is a very large population that only uses computers in coffee shops and, and likewise, in ca uh, PC or internet cafeterias. So let's accept that number, but, but we have a problem because I've seen various figures reported for how many Windows desktop licenses Microsoft has, and that varies somewhere between 350 and 540 million. Well, either every machine that's in use has Microsoft Windows on it or it's licensed for it, which I can believe given the way that, these pro that the product has been sold, or something is amiss, and we'll have to agree that these numbers are a little bit jelly. So I, I think I've painted an ad adequate picture of what the market consists of. Let's try to segment that. The enterprise space has more than 500 employees. There are globally about 50,000 customer opportunities. Now, those 50,000 customer opportunities account 
for somewhere between 6 and 8% and of all of the servers sold, and let's grant the fact that they are expensive servers. <coughs> so therefore, if we estimate this by value, we could conceive of the fact that these 50,000 customer opportunities globally may in fact account for something of the order of 20 to 25 percent of the value of the IT market. <coughs> However, I think we also need to be very fair and recognize that in the enter this very enterprise space of 50,000 customer opportunities, Every IT vendor in the world wants his slice of it because once they get a big customer, they can pump their chest out and say, I'm significant. I play with all the big boys. And that means, by definition, that the enterprise market space, despite the fact that it may account for 25% of the total expenditure on information technology actually is so competitive that no one is very profitable in it. Am I still making sense to everyone? So if you were choosing a market in which to compete, would you choose a market that is wholly competitive and totally unprofitable to pitch your tent and to raise your flag and claim your turf? Or would you choose a market that is relatively untouched that is totally disenchanted with the incumbent supplier, where the, the channel for it is starving and oxygen starved and is, is dying at an incredible rate and needs revival and is wanting to find an alternative solution if only someone would give them what they need. Am I still making sense to everyone? The small to medium enterprise customer <coughs> employs between 150 and 500 people, there are about 300,000 cu customer opportunities globally. The small to medium business market employs two to 150 people, and there are about 30 million of them globally. And then we have the consumer marketplace, which equates to about 974 million real consumers. Now, you know, we can argue about the numbers, 1% or 2%, 5%, even if it's 10% out, who cares? We're looking for barometers. We're looking for indicators of, you know, if you, have any of you ever been out chasing rabbits? Now, rabbits hide in rabbit warrens. And smart rabbiters take a ferret with them, and the ferret will go down the rabbit hole... <coughs> And the ferrets can smell the rabbit at a long distance. So wouldn't you want to ferret your rabbit out from the hole that he's in rather than send your ferret down a hole that, it, that, the, that, that the rabbit's not in? That's what this is about. Where are we going to get the rabbit from? Where, where are we going to pull out the bunny with the white ears? <clears throat> <clears throat> so let's consider the nature of the buying public in each of these markets. The enterprise market is staffed by experts. Some IT business is outsourced, in some cases all of it, but on the whole, most, of, uh, most IT in enterprise class customers is handled by internal staff. There's a complex buying process that takes 12 to 18 months from beginning to end. I've been involved, I've been a part of this, I've seen the dynamics of it. Additionally, a server is typically purchased and runs for three to four years, whatever its life cycle is, and at the end of the life cycle, it gets carted out to the computer graveyard. The software life cycle in the enterprise space is six to 12 years. Now, some VARs have told me that I'm completely optimistic and I'm smoking pot that the real life of software is more like 30 years in the enterprise space. That depends on whether we are talking commodity software or relative commodity software or in-house custom engineered software. And clearly, the references we heard this morning to, to, from um, Gordon Bruce, uh, that related to software that was custom engineered and some of that software is 40, 50, 60 years old. That's not what we are referring to here. I'm not trying to displace a mainframe. 
That's what that software runs on. I'm talking about commodity stuff. No matter which way you like to dice your cheese, the fact remains that in the enterprise marketplace, the process of selling a new business solution is going to take you 12 to 18 months if the customer happens to be ready to buy. And he may not be ready to buy for another 5 to 12 years. That means the sales cycle is very long. Additionally, the traditional Linux companies have tried to target Unix as the so-called low-hanging fruit. The reality is Linux has been adopted predominantly for web server applications and web-enabled applications and not to replace applications that were previously hosted on Sun Solaris systems, on GE Unix systems, on HPUX systems and AIX systems running in applications like Progress Software, a 3GL now billed as a 5GL or whatever they peddle it as, PIC applications. There are over 80,000 business applications that run on PIC. I have tried to port applications off a SCO Unix system onto Linux using the Intel binary compatibility subsystem and just porting that across running the same binary without having to recompile presented major problems because prints pool handling is different. The application was actually written to read back print spool information from the native print spooler and just having the columnation of the results off by one character was enough to break the application. And that meant that in order to port that system across, I had to modify the print spooling uh, status reporting tool so that it formatted the information correctly for the application. And that took me two weeks to do before I had everything working. That's also why companies like Raining Data that produce PIC, a PIC operating implement, a system implementation, they ported once to Red Hat 6 and basically abandoned the, the project because by the time they'd finished certifying, Red Hat had a new version out and it no longer ran on the new version. And certification is a really big thing. That can take up to 18 months for some platforms. The point that I'm making is that to target Unix as low-hanging fruit to switch Solaris out with Linux is kind of like dreaming of fairies. Do I make sense or am I still smoking pot? So, <clears throat> switching Unix to Linux is not going to happen very rapidly in that marketplace. That's the bottom line. And it's a long road to hoe. And that's why, in my opinion, the Linux companies that have targeted that area have met with some marginal success. I'll come back to that. In the SME market space, staff are mainly qualified they despise open source or software platform operating system religion. Basically, people in the SME business space just want to know, does it work or does it not work? They put in a Windows DHCP server. It didn't work. They try a Linux system with the ISC DHCP server. It works. Do they argue? No, they let it run and forget about it. How long do they forget about it? Until it breaks. Then all of a sudden they have to replace it. <clears throat> Purchase decisions in the SME marketplace are driven by technical needs. The typical project conception to completion time frame is 6 to 12 months. Oh, and I should add, when you get the order as a VAR, they typically want it running inside two weeks. Am I still right on there? The answer was yes. The software life cycle, however, uh, sorry, the hardware life, life cycle is three to four years, but the equipment typically only serves its role in a particular environment or for a particular purpose for how long? Would you say 18 months? 
and then it gets trickled down, gets replaced with a newer machine, and what happens when a new server is purchased in this marketplace is it comes with a nice new monitor. The CEO gets a nice new monitor. His monitor goes to his secretary. Her monitor goes to the next guy, and that way all the hardware trickles from the most important um, application right down to the least application until eventually it falls off the end into the garbage tip or into the recycling bin or someone takes it home. Software life cycle is 10 to 20 years. It's a hard sell to replace software in the SME marketplace. That's why we've tended to focus on new applications. And now a novel concept I'd like to introduce is the life cycle of a customer for a VAR. I polled a huge number of resellers. Some of them insisted that they have had the same customers for the last 20 years. One, a guy I get on rather well with, although I sometimes question what he eats for breakfast, he says, I have 53 problems. You might call them customers. I don't want another problem. I don't want any more customers. I'm happy with what I have. So I said to him, Bill, what do you do to, replay, to, to keep your customers up to date? Oh, he said, well, I get invited to Microsoft demonstrations of their software, and after I've seen how it works, I tell all my customers about it, and typically half a dozen to a dozen will tell me to come and, and deploy it. And because I've seen that it works, I'm confident in deploying it. So, Bill, how much time do you spend updating yourself on Linux? Well, none. I don't have time. I'm too busy keeping my customers afloat. Well, Bill, how many times have you been approached by companies like IBM, Novell, and others to demonstrate the deployment and the use of a Linux-based product? How many times do you think he's been invited in the last two years? It's a donut because Linux companies don't do that. You're supposed to be smart enough that you just happen to know all of the stuff that you need to know as a reseller. So in the SMB marketplace, we now have a different customer profile. We have very few full-time IT staff. Most IT is fully outsourced to value-added service providers. They will typically call their favorite vendor with whom they may have been dealing for, you know, 15, 20 years, and they'll say, hey, and I'm just using Bill as an example, Bill, will you come out here and give us a new mail server or give us a new email system? Or they will call Bill with the absolute envy of his life. Oh, Bill, the network's not working. Well, did you turn the server off? We don't know. The network's not working. That's all that matters. The network's not working, Bill. Come and fix it. You don't have customers like that, do you? <clears throat> what was that? Yeah, I think I just did. <laughs> Typical hardware life cycles in that part of the market are five to eight years. They will upgrade and recycle through um, the life cycle, that is, a new server will typically come into the most important role, but that part of the market generally won't pay a lot of money for ser a service to be recycled, so typically the recycling is kind of an afterthought. Do you still agree with that? Yeah, he's nodding his head again. Vendors typically assist the customer with a pur purchase. In fact, in m most cases, because they have a relationship of trust with the, with the value-added service provider, they will simply say, look, tell us what to order or buy it for us and just drop it on site. Make the pain go away. Many of the resellers, therefore, ship white boxes. Why do you think they sell white boxes? Very loud, please. They're cheap. There's one other reason why vendors sell white boxes. Now, I want you to say yes really loudly if I've got this one right. It's because after you've sold a white box, there's no warranty registration card and there is no danger 
of the OEM manufacturer calling the customer to sell behind your back and to quit you to do you out of the business. Can't say yes to that, but it sounds plausible. You see, I've done business on, in a number of cases where because I introduced a large OEM vendor to an, a nice, sizable chunk of business, within weeks at the outside, the vendor had a direct salesperson in touch with my customer and cut me out of the business. Has that happened to you? The answer was just yes to that question. A purchase t cycle is typically 30 to 60 days. Now just remember the purchase cycle for these three business market segments, which is the one where a knock on the door with a positive response is likely to get you the business the fastest. This one. Which of these markets has the largest number of customer opportunities? This one. Which of these markets is the most hungry for a solution that just works? This one, why is it that not one Linux vendor is targeting this part of the market? What was that? That is rhetorical, yes. Feedback. Most SMB customers have had bad experience with defective hardware, with software vendors, uh, software problems, and with bad VARs. That's why they are loyal to one who works for them, even if he's not as good as they might like him to be, even though the buddy they play golf with may recommend someone else as much better. They're so petrified of another embarrassing situation, they won't change. Am I still on? Too many people nodding. Let me see if the next point is right. The small to medium business place customer whines and moans an awful lot. <laughs> Did I get that one right? <laughs> that was rhetorical. <laughs> but they are loyal. They always ask for a lower price, right? They don't care what the solution is, it just has to work. They complain about Windows problems but simply put up with it because they haven't been given an alternative. What happens in this part of the market when they become aware of a better alternative? They go for it. Most SMBs want something newer, smarter, or better. The consumer market purchase IT hardware and software from retail stores. Many purchase online. Many buy direct from Dell and IBM and HP and Gateway. But you see, that, that part of the market represents a real, and presents a real problem for us because, by and large, the retail channel is antagonistic to an alternative to Windows. This much I have discovered by polling CompUSA, Best Buy, Circuit City, and Fry's Electronic Stores. They, consider, they believe that PCs sold with Linux on them mean more trouble and less money. And no demand because no customers are asking for them. Customers aren't asking for them because for the greater part they don't even know it exists. That's not must, but most hardware sold by major outlets oh. Is, is not supported by Linux. This, is, this presentation was kind of thrown together towards the end. I was having troubles with uh, OpenOffice um, uh, not liking my content. So where is Microsoft? Well, Microsoft have over 90% of all desk, desktop PCs and laptops. Those devices come pre-installed with Windows, and if you've ever tried to purchase uh, from CompUSA or from Best Buy, a laptop where you don't have to pay the Microsoft tax. They would rather you don't buy the thing from them than sell it to you with any sort of form of compensation. In other words, the price of the windows is something you just have to wear. As was mentioned yesterday, the resale channel, rather than making an extra $40 on a sale because of the, the system's got Linux on it, they would prefer to cut the price by $40 because that way they believe they'll sell more. 
<clears throat> As we also heard yesterday from uh, Tom Welch, the consumer market expects to use antivirus software to sell a Linux solution without it is almost futile. It expect, that part of the market expects regular updates and they expect a wide selection of ready-to-run, easy-to-install, binary-only distribution software. Let's be frank, Microsoft own this consumer with a near-total monopoly. The SMB market the, is uh, where Microsoft have their main outlet for their products. The small business server is the dominant product they sell there. It ties the desktop in place. The channel is the means by which Microsoft deliver that product. The, the channel tend to install the systems. Uh, VARs mostly provide the updates. Very few end users in, that, in the SMB space do their own regular system updates. Microsoft have significantly changed that in the last few years with the automated update process. But even Microsoft today are unhappy with how few uh, sites automatically do update. Uh, VARs attend regular trade meetings at which they are briefed and kept up to date on the Microsoft solutions, and there they do not hear about Linux except in a very negative and derogatory vein. This is Microsoft's breadbasket. If ever a Linux company were to learn to tackle this part of the market, they can expect retaliation because kicking Microsoft in the shins in this part of the market is going to hurt them big time. Right now, Microsoft used the presence of Linux in the enterprise sp space as a smokescreen to deflect attention away from their real marketplace. The SME market is where they sell a huge wad of Windows Server 2003. It's totally tied to Active Directory. It's where there's a lot of file and print services, and it is still a market that's relatively untouched by Linux. The enterprise space is where everyone is playing. Microsoft would like to be there, but really it's traditional Unix territory. It's where Unix has had its stronghold. It's also the part of the market where the web server presence is most predominant. Not exclusive, I recognize that. I recognize that there are five-man companies that do millions of dollars worth of business hosting web applications. Let, let's treat those as outliers because there globally are really not that many of those shops around. And my friend Rob here would probably disagree with that statement, but that's okay too. Microsoft had... Sorry? Okay. Microsoft, however, are desperate to protect the business market they have in the SMB and consumer marketplace, and that's why they're so aggressive about countering potential loss of market dominance and also why they pressure OEM companies to not support Linux. And that means that if we want to materially change the market share that Linux has, we have to start tackling the, the small to medium business marketplace. And we have to find a creative way of delivering tangible and tractable, cost-efficient business solutions through the reseller channel to the small user. So where is Linux? Well, Red Hat and Novell both target what they consider to be the low-hanging fruit, which is basically to tackle Sun's business. It's understandable, but that's where they are. Both work hand-in-hand -hand with OEM hardware vendors and with Intel and AMD. And, of course, Intel and AMD are laughing all the way to the bank about this because it is expanding the market for Intel and AMD CPUs and knocking out some of that, you know, that Spark stuff. <clears throat> Both believe that the cost of market entry into the SMB marketplace is high, and if you haven't got a channel, you have to build a channel, and let's be real frank about this, they're right, it's costly to build a channel. But why haven't the open source community been far more proactive in creating that channel 
because by opening that channel and creating business opportunity in the SMB market space, we will be creating greater employment opportunity for open source oriented people with companies like Novell and Red Hat and the service providers and VARs that service that marketplace. So there's a net win-win if we were just to, know, to uh, put our shoulder to the grindstone and start to produce more tractable solutions for that part of the market. Now, there's something very important about this. How many of you have deployed Microsoft Small Business Server? How difficult is it? It isn't. You answer about 11 questions in the process of installing it, and when it's finished rebooting, your server is up and running with a DHCP server, a dynamic DNS server, a file and print server, your electronic messaging, your SQL server, a firewall, all of it is fully configured. Can you name one Linux distribution that installs in about half to three quarters of an hour that for which you have to answer only 11 fairly logical questions with relatively sensible defaults that will automatically configure all of those services to just work? A little louder, please. The only way that you can get that is on an appliance, is what the man said. But an appliance is not what the Microsoft solution is. It offers greater flexibility than that. And I believe therein lies the dilemma of using open source software in the SMB space. <clears throat> or as one of, uh, one of the SMB customers that tried to deploy it, that hired a university student to come and help him to get Linux in because the kid bugged him until he just couldn't hold him back. He said, come and show me how easy it is. And the kid was there for three weeks during his vacation and at the end of it, the system was barely usable. And that speaks very poorly to that part of the market of open source and its capability. The key factors explaining why existing Linux vendors have little presence in the SMB market is first of all the belief that they are too small to compete with Microsoft. They fear Microsoft's competitive force. They have a certain disdain for the channel. I have heard existing Linux companies that perhaps no longer exist say that the channel is nothing but snakes and vipers. You can't trust them with a dead grandmother, they'll still eat her up. Well, you know, if you don't trust your channel, you've got a real problem. And above all, the entire Linux community, I believe, is guilty of having a disdain for Microsoft and wanting to separate themselves from anything that Microsoft do. In fact, by definition almost, anything that Microsoft make easy to do is by definition not kosher and not acceptable. After all, it's too easy and therefore it can't be any good. There is a mistaken belief that Microsoft technology is inferior. I believe it is not. I believe it is highly up to the task for which it is built. And as other speakers at this conference have said, 